Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We check out everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Uh, today is February 3rd, 2023. So if you're watching this in the future, that's when this was recorded. Uh, we generally do these live. So uh, thanks for everyone who's been hanging out with us this whole time. And uh, yeah, so welcome to February. Uh, I don't know where January went. That's typically how this tends to go, though, is the time just flies by at this point. Um, today we're checking out the night skies of February, what's going on and seeing all the fun stuff. And we're also talking about our new target of the month challenge target uh, for the month of February. So we'll be doing that as well. Um, if you like what you see here on the Skywatcher YouTube uh, channel, please go ahead and hit subscribe um, or leave a like on a video. It lets us know we're doing a good job and that we should keep doing this uh, and having you on with us every Friday. Um, if you have an idea for a future What's Up webcast episode, please email us at info at skywatcherusa.com and title it What's Up, and uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, if you want to stay in the loop of what's going on here at Skywatcher, from sales to uh, what's going on for the webcast to just our monthly email blast, go to skywatcherusa.com. Go up at the top, click subscribe and save, and then pop your email in there, and then that will keep you in the loop on what is going on here at Skywatcher. Uh, so let's get started, we'll jump right into it. Uh, the brightest thing in the nighttime sky, of course, is the moon. And the new moon for the month is February 20th. Uh, so that is coming up you know, later in the month. Um, that puts our dark sky weekend on the 18th and 19th. So if you're heading out to do some dark sky observing, uh, that would be the time to go do it. A uh, full moon for the month is going to be February 5th, so Sunday. Uh, this weekend is the full moon, and the full moon for February is known as the snow moon. That's generally for the heavy snowfall this time of year. Um, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I couldn't tell you what snow actually is. It's right up there with Bigfoot and unicorns. It just doesn't exist. But to those of you who are getting snowed on, sorry. Um, you know, but... That it does happen a lot when we go to Neef. Every year, we'll go up there in April, and everyone in the, the, the Northeast is usually like, yeah, we had a really bad winter and too much snow. Wouldn't know a thing about it. So that's why I live in the desert. But I commend those who go out there in the snow, especially like Trevor from Astro Backyard. I don't know how you guys do it. You go observing in the snow. It seems crazy, but I commend you. But anyway, that is the snow moon, uh, which is the full moon for February. So... Um, if you're going to be out there checking out the full moon, go check it out. Uh, planets. Uh, let's hop over to uh, Stellarium. Stellarium is a free uh, program you can get online. It's an awesome uh, program. That, it's a planetarium uh, program. I believe it's also an app, so you can get it on your uh, wireless device. Um, there is telescope control with this. Uh, you can control Skywatcher equipment with Stellarium with the proper setup. Um, but Stellarium is an awesome uh, free program that you can go get just to kind of mess around with what's going up in the nighttime sky. So um, you've probably noticed uh, this month we've actually gained Venus um, is shining bright in the western sky just after sunset. Um, so that is our new addition into the evening. Now just moving up from Venus um, and crossing the sky, the planet Neptune is still hanging out there, which you could probably grab in the early evening, but it's going to be... Um, pretty much gone by the end of the month. Um, whoa, too much. Back, 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 back. I hit too many buttons. There we go. Um, let me see. Two, that's fine. Um, so yeah, we have Venus, uh, which would be naked eye visible. Then Neptune. Neptune's probably going to be gone just a couple hours after sunset. And by the end of the month, it'll just be gone from the nighttime sky. So if you want to grab Neptune, you really have to do it right after sunset and it is getting low, so it's not an ideal position. Um, following Neptune, of course, we have Jupiter, which is naked eye visible. That's gonna be visible for a couple hours um, after sunset. There we go, that's better, so we don't fly through things. It's gonna be gone probably about 9.30. Um, it'll be out of the sky um, at this point. And by the end of the month, um, it's 
pretty much going to be the end of the season there for Jupiter. Uh, well, not quite. Um, but right at the end of the month, we're going to have a really awesome conjunction between Venus and Jupiter. That's going to be great on the 28th of uh, February. And then we'll cheat a little bit. Um, March 1st is actually going to be the closest conjunction. That's going to be a pretty cool photo op there. You'll have Jupiter, three of the bright Galilean moons, and Venus. I think Venus is still going to be, yeah, Venus is still going to be a gibbous phase. So it's going to be a big bright ball. Uh, but that'll be kind of a cool photo op there. Um, if you want to get Venus and Jupiter together, that's going to be, you actually have a, a little bit of time to mess around with it, but that's going to be at the end of the month. Uh, there is going to be March 1st, but uh, on February 28th, you'll have a good one. And then of course, March 2nd, um, it'll be pretty cool. So towards the end of the month, early part of next month, we'll have this really nice conjunction going on um, between the two bright planets there. And then if you want to throw the moon into it, um, you're going to have a very cool conjunction with Jupiter and a very nice crescent moon. That's going to be on the 22nd of February. So there'll be kind of some cool photo ops uh, showing up there. If you want all three in a row, you have a very thin crescent moon, Venus and Jupiter all together on the 21st. Um, so there's going to be some cool stuff going on as far as planets and conjunctions. Uh, what's going on over here? Oh, Hubble, that's going to be too faint. Why is it that bright? Um, so that's that for the planets. And then, of course, hanging way up high, we still have the planet. Uh, Uranus is still hanging out um, pretty high in the sky, even late in the month. Uh, so Uranus is still an easy uh, grab right now. If you want to go uh, get, uh, observe the planet there, it's high enough, and it can be visible in most telescopes. And then, of course, we have Mars hanging way up high, um, almost at the zenith right now. It's not ideal anymore. It is moving uh, further away uh, from us. You could probably still get a decent view of it um, with a little orange ball, maybe some detail, but there's not a ton going on um, with it right now. But it is placed very high in the sky right now. Um, so that'll be kind of a cool uh, object to go out and see as well. Um, not too far from the Pleiades. So, yeah. Um, that's pretty much it for the planets right there. Most of the, we're, we're almost through planetary season right now. Um, you know, Saturn is gone. We are getting Venus. Jupiter is, will be leaving by the end of the month. Um, Neptune's going down. Uh, Uranus and Mars will still be hanging out up there. Um, but most of our naked eye planets are going to be out of the sky by the end of February into early March. Uh, so that's what's going on there in the solar system. Next up, we've got the sun. Now, the sun has been very active as of late because we are getting up into solar maximum, which is going to make the two upcoming eclipses, uh, one on October of this year and then April of next year is the total eclipse, um, really exciting because there's a ton of detail going on, especially if you have a solar telescope, like a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. I would also say do not ever observe the sun without the proper equipment. Uh, we do have multiple episodes uh, here at the What's Up webcast that go over the safety of observing the sun and how to do that effectively with the proper equipment. You can go back and watch those episodes. Um, and if you are looking for equipment for these upcoming eclipses, now would be the time to actually get started on doing and getting that equipment because time is ticking at this point. And the closer and closer we get to October, for the partial eclipse or annular, depending on where you're at, all that equipment and all those eye glasses and all the special stuff for observing an eclipse are going to evaporate. Um, and there's probably not going to be much of a lull between that and the 2024 eclipse in April. So now is the time to get your orders in. If you want something, now's the time to do it, um, to go out and check that out. So I would not hesitate on getting solar equipment right now um, because it's going to disappear very quickly as we get towards the end of the year. Uh, let's see what's going up on the sun today. Uh, right now there's a couple very impressive prominences hanging out. There's a big one up here, a big one down here, and then there's a lot of very nice filaments up on the sun today. Um, I like using this website. Uh, it's called Gong. Um, I actually just do a Google search for Gong, G-O-N-G-H alpha, and it brings you up here. 
These are fairly live images. Uh, this one's the most recent that I have up here. It's about three minutes old. Um, but there's a lot of very nice detail on the sun today, especially if you have a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. Uh, go out and observe it. It's going to allow you to see all the detail there. Um, but very cool stuff going on out there on the sun. Um, but it is ever-changing. That's why the sun is a, a great object to go observe because um, it's changing all the time. But, yeah. Uh, meteor showers. There's no major meteor showers actually happening this month, unfortunately. So if you see a shooting star, um, it's not really a part of any major meteor shower at this point. But um, there will be some coming up in the coming months. However, comets... There's a lot of discussion going on about comets right now because we have this guy floating through the solar system. This is Comet uh, C2022E3ZTF. Yeah, or ETZ. I forgot what it is. But C2022E3 uh, um, is actually cruising pretty far in the north right now. And it's actually heading up towards the planet Mars. Let me see if we can pin it down in here. Let's see. 2022 e 3 Wow, it's not in Stellarium. That's surprising. Interesting. Huh. Okay, well, that's new. I Stellarium's usually very up-to-date um, with targets. So, I'm kind of surprised it's not in here. ZTF. Let me see if that brings it up. Thank you, David interesting all right well um that's odd maybe it's the time that'd probably be it uh what's today the third yep right there let's try this again search interesting doesn't even come up that's weird um so comet c2022 e3 is actually hanging up right around here let me look up on my phone because sky safari is up to date uh let me put this to this evening bear with me just a sec i want to figure out where it is i'm actually really surprised stellarium's usually pretty good about this um it should have been configured already but uh so let's see it's hanging up right about anyway okay it's kind of up here right now um right about capella camel berenices uh all that um i know i thought i added comments or comments to the database because i've looked up comments before um i'll have to double check why that's not done on it but anyway um, right now, uh, Comet C2023 is hanging right about here, um, and it's actually making its way to a close approach with Mars on the 11th of this month. Um, so that's going to be kind of a cool photo op there, if you can get it there. The problem right now, I think, with this comet, honestly, is over the last few days, because it's been moving in its position, the nice detailed tail that you see here is kind of gone it's kind of turned into this little um very thin tail uh so all these kind of cool little nebulous details aren't visible anymore um this was taken with our remote telescope uh, a few days ago it's a four panel mosaic because it's an esprit 150 so i don't have a big scale uh to get all this packed in there um but it's still gonna be a cool photo op if you've tried to get it visually it just looks like a little fuzzy um and it's easy to see in binoculars and telescopes um i have not tried to get to a darker location um, i will be out on the 11th at a darker site so i'm gonna try to see it there um but it was its close approach this past weekend so now it's just gonna start uh dwindling a little bit so we'll we'll see comets are crazy so um, but get out there and try to check it out. Um, if you want to see what other comets are up right now and all the details about it, um, I go to cometchasing.skyhound.com. Um, but uh, Comet E3 
is really the the big one right now um so there might be but uh, there's all these other comments that are up right now but the best one right now is c2022 uh, e3 ztf um so it's a very good part of the sky here in the northern hemisphere so go out and give that a shot um, a lot of people are getting really good images off of it it's funny because they're always telling on the news it's like the green comet all comets are green because of the cyanogen uh, that's in it um, so it's not uncommon for a comet to not be green it's actually weirder when they're not um, but anyway uh, that's what's going on there in the world of comets i'm sure many of you already knew that um, next month i will make sure that comets are on in stellarium because it should have been on um, but yeah so good luck to you on that go out get some observing done on it and see what you can get out of it uh, deep sky so we're in a really cool time uh, to get out and do some observing because we're kind of in that uh, spot where you know we have a ton of good winter stuff up right now um, you have all the major constellations in the winter hexagon that are visible um, there's a lot of cool nebulas up right now, uh, even really faint, obscure things. Of course, we have our nice comet that's visible at the moment, uh, but there is a ton of stuff to go out and observe. And then the later and later you stay up, obviously we get more into what's going to be the springtime and then we get all of our galaxies that are coming up. But right now we're not going to jump completely into galaxies because they will have plenty of time to do that when we get into the spring months. So we'll just kind of take a look at what's going up right now. Of course, the big one is M42. Um, everyone knows this nebula, 1500 light years away. This is the easiest nebula to observe in the nighttime sky. You can see it in a pair of binoculars. Uh, you can see it in large telescopes. You can see it in basically any type of telescope and it's going to look impressive no matter what. And of course, if you get to dark sky sites, then it's way better. Um, in detail and uh, it looks awesome in night vision too if you happen to have access to a setup like that but the night vision is very impressive I've started observing it a lot more lately with the hydrogen um, alpha filters and a night vision setup it's impressive um, but this is a fantastic object to actually do imaging with it as to, uh, I cannot talk um, it's a fantastic object to image as well because it's very easy to do. Um, it's actually a very good target to learn um, a couple different techniques on because it is so bright and it's so easy to do, but it does have its own inherent challenges on it. So um, with this nebula, usually if you're shooting it long enough, you're going to bring out all the nice uh, flowy details that you see in this image here, but the core of the nebula tends to blow out um, even with long exposures. So generally what you want to do is shoot this on a set of long exposures to bring out the faint uh, wispy details that you want uh, and then go back and shoot the core with shorter exposures and then you learn how to process those two together uh, which is something I had to learn to do on this image. It took a little bit of time to figure that out but it's a very good technique to start learning how to deal with uh, blowing out brighter regions of an object and how to handle that especially when there's a lot of very nice faint detail involved with a very bright object as well. Now, all the little wispy details that you see outside of the main portion of the nebula, I find that that is best done in hydrogen alpha, especially if you have a monochrome camera. Um, what's nice about having a monochrome system over a color is that you do have the capability of isolating all the different channels. You can do your luminance, you can do red, green, blue, and then you can also start to blend narrow band uh, detail into it, which is what this is. So this was a um, very deep luminance shot, followed up with a one shot color image. And then I applied the luminance to the one shot color, which gave me a very nice set of detail. And then finally, I went back and shot the region in hydrogen alpha, and then I wove that kind of into some of the channels to bring out some of the faint structure and detail of what you see in the, the dust and the nebulosity there. So you can actually start to play uh, and learn different techniques with this nebula because it's very forgiving and there's a lot of detail, both bright and faint. So it's a good one to practice on. Um, and I mean, it's a favorite amongst everybody. And it looks good in a lens. It looks good in a large telescope. There's a lot of ways you can approach it. You can even do um, 
different types of narrowband work on it, like bicolor images or even a full Hubble palette if you want to start messing around um, with different types of techniques. So that's what's nice about M42 in that region is there's a lot of stuff that you can do and a lot of things that you can learn about it that maybe you can apply to other objects in the nighttime sky. Now, right next door is IC434, um, also uh, pinned down as the Horsehead Nebula. It's right next to the sword area about 1300 light years away visually this object is very challenging uh, to do which is funny because it's one of the easiest objects to probably do in the winter time photographically so there are very different parts of the spectrum um, depending on how you're approaching your observations of the horsehead nebula now i see 434 is actually the red portion of the nebula the horsehead itself is barnard 33 um, so there's different distinctions, um, depending on which part of the nebula you're actually looking for, but it's all part of the same field. So, um, the horse head visually is quite difficult. Um, even in large telescopes like my 28 inch, um, it is visible without a filter. The addition of an H beta filter is really kind of the secret to see the horse head because you need to be able to bring out IC 434, which is the red part of the, uh, the nebula right here. That's what you're trying to bring out with an H beta filter because it's all hydrogen. Um, now, the reason why we use an H beta filter visually over an H alpha filter is H beta shows the same detail that H alpha does, except H beta happens to be in a part of the spectrum, usually that bluish green color, which is more, the human eye is more sensitive to, where the red part of the spectrum, our eyes don't do as well. So an H alpha filter does no benefit for us visually because we just don't have the sensitivity to our eyes in that part of the spectrum, where an H beta gives us the same detail as alpha, but it allows our eyes to see it. Uh, but it's still a very selective filter um, H beta works on a lot of different nebulas, so it's a fun one to experiment, but everyone's kind of dubbed it the horsehead ne horse filter because that's the key uh, to being able to see it in most telescopes. Um, I have seen the horsehead in a telescope as small as a 6 inch aperture, 150 millimeter, but the more aperture you have, the better. Um, it does take up more of the field than people expect. So uh, take your time when you're observing this. Uh, dark, high contrast skies are really the best way to do dark nebulas. But make sure you take your time. And if you have a friend who's got a decent aperture telescope, I'd probably say 15 inch or larger. Uh, definitely have them throw it on there because aperture is going to be your friend as well, especially when using an H beta filter because you're filtering quite a lot of light out of there. Um, however, if you are a night vision person like myself, game over it's easy it's really easy because the night vision just kills it um it's quite an awesome view um, in a night vision system but for most telescopes it is within uh their capability to see the horse head visually but it's a challenge so take your time on this really try to observe the field if you're using a dobsonian and you can't quite get it uh grab the front of the telescope and move it side to side and watch what moves with the star field. I find that's the best way to actually get uh, acclimated to this region, especially if you've never observed the horse head before, is you want to see what's going to move with the field. And then once your eye detects where the horse actually is, it's a lot easier to know that. So um, that's ultimately what you're looking for. The flame nebula, which is right next door, is very easy. Most telescopes will actually see that without the addition of any kind of filter. Um, that will tell you that you're on the field. And of course you have the massively bright star Alnitak, um, which is in the belt region right there. It's a naked eye star at that point. So it's not a hard object to find, but it is a hard object to see. Imaging wise, it's a walk in the park. The biggest problem you're going to have imaging is that freaking bright star Alnitak. Um, it is incredibly bright. It's a naked eye star. So you are going to have to deal with that and hopefully your telescope is well baffled so you're not getting super crazy glare. Um, if you have filters that are not quite up to the task of dealing with glare, you are going to know about it very quickly with Alnitak. Um, you're going to have halos. 
you're going to have crazy reflections. It's, it's something that can be very difficult to deal with because you're dealing with a very bright star. But at most telescopes are pretty well baffled. They can handle this without an issue. And most modern day imaging filters won't give you the glare, um, hopefully. So, but it's a fun one to do. Uh, the horse head is very easy to do in monochrome and color. It works well with um, narrowband filters. And especially if you're doing in town with a one shot color, I'd use a multiband narrowband like an L Enhance or an Antlia dual band or something like that. It would be a very easy thing to come out with. And then of course, if you're going to dark skies, give it a shot. What I would say if you're doing monochrome imaging with this particular target is do your luminance RGB, but then go back um, just like we talked about with um, M42 and go back and do some hydrogen alpha because if you do some hydrogen alpha, you're going to bring out what I call the paint strokes or the brush strokes, which are these really faint little streaks that sit right above uh, the horse head in uh, IC434 where it looks like brush strokes. The H alpha does a very good job at bringing that out and then try to weave that H alpha data into your color data and it gives you some of that structure and some of that pop um, in IC434. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, next up is M45, the Pleiades cluster. That's up in Taurus, about 500 light years away. Um, it's great in any size uh, telescope. Uh, you can see it naked eye. It looks good in binoculars. Um, dark skies are very nice. Uh, now the Pleiades is kind of interesting because it also has that nebulosity in there. That nebulosity is a reflection nebula. So that's dust that is reflecting the starlight uh, of the stars. Now, the thing about reflection nebulas is there's no filter that's going to help you here. Um, so you really just have to have dark skies to get it or the cameras just need to be good enough to get it. But there's no filter that will help you with a reflection nebula, honestly. Um, you can try to combat that with like a light pollution filter to help pop that nebula out. But there's nothing like an emission nebula that you can't just isolate a, a frequency of light like you can an emission nebula. Reflection just requires dark skies or you dealing with light pollution somehow. Uh, you can see the nebulosity in the Pleiades in dark skies. Um, usually aperture is always going to help. But again, it's kind of like the horse head where you want to move the telescope and see what part moves with it. Um, but aperture does help. Uh, imaging the Pleiades is easy. You can get it in any location. You're not really aided by any filters whatsoever. So you just kind of have to hit it and go for it um, and see what you get out of it. But dark skies do help, especially if you're trying to get all the very thin, delicate wisps of dust that sit in this region um, as well. So it's a really fun target. Um, it looks good in a variety of focal lengths. So you can zoom into it with a thousand millimeters. You can go real wide. Or if you've got like a telephoto lens, there's a lot of very interesting detail that sits even beyond the Pleiades because of just the amount of dust um, that sits in that region and all those molecular clouds and the really cool stuff that's out there. So uh, definitely worthwhile. Um, so that's going to be um, something that, I would go out and check out if you have the ability. Uh, next up is M78. We're also in the Hunter at this point, 1600 light years away. Um, M78 is a tricky one in the sense that it is also kind of a reflection nebula and dark nebula. It sits not far from the Barnard loop, which is a massive loop of hydrogen and the constellation Orion. Um, so that's something that, uh, you want to check out M78 because of its nature is just requires aperture. You can, it doesn't ever really look awe-inspiring uh, because it is a reflection and dark nebula. So you really just need dark skies and yeah, you need dark skies. There's nothing that you can really do with it. It's a little bit more of a challenging target uh, visually. Now, because it sits very close to that Barnard loop, there is a lot of hydrogen in the region. So if you're imaging this, I do recommend, like I said with the other ones, if you're doing monochrome or even color, if you can find a way to weave some hydrogen in there, it's going to pop uh, some of that detail out in the Barnard loop there if you can. Uh, but M78 is a fun one. There's a lot of very delicate dark detail in there. So a good luminance channel if you're doing monochrome is required to really pop that detail out. 
or just a lot of time on a one shot color, but give it a shot. It's a fun one to go after. Sharpless 308. Now this was almost a totem target uh, for the month. However, because of how far south it sits in Canis Majoris, um, we were kind of worried about our friends in Canada not being able to get time on it because it sits fairly low. Um, even here in the southern part of uh, the United States, the window to image this target is not much. It tends to be a multi-night target. So <clears throat> that's something that you want to pay attention to. Um, is it there's I think here in Arizona and Southern California, there's like a, a nice four hour window to get it. Um, maybe a little bit longer, um, depending on what you're doing, but <clears throat> it does take some time. And I find that if you really want to go deep on this object, it tends to be a multi-night imaging run. So if you're trying to see this visually, it's a dark sky target. It's big um, as well. So you might need something that's got some field of view and it's, as with a lot of planetary nebulas, it's very heavy in O3. So an oxygen three filter is going to be required. Now that's also going to be the same if you're trying to go after this imaging wise is this does well in narrow band. This is a bicolor image. So it means there's H alpha and oxygen three paired together to make a color filter or color image. You can do RGB of this, but where this uh, nebula really, really shines is really in that oxygen three um, side of uh, the spectrum. So you're going to need a lot of data in O3. Uh, there's a lot of signal in there, but that is also something you need to be aware of is oxygen three also has, is in the very same wavelength where a lot of moonlight actually comes through. So O3 is not as forgiving when the moon is up, unless you have a very narrow filter. Um, that's why a lot of people have like a five or three nanometer oxygen three in their imaging filters, because it allows you to use it more often, even when the moon is up. So that's something that you want to keep in mind when you're dealing with uh, this nebula. It's also called the dolphin because it looks kind of like a dolphin, uh, but that is Sharpless 308. It's a good challenge target um, if people are looking to do it, but the further north you go the harder it is to get it so that is why we did not put that as a totem target um, for our friends up north of course high overhead we have m1 the crab nebula uh, this is in taurus about 6500 light years away uh, it's a supernova remnant it's a fun one to go after there's not a lot to it um, unless you have some very large aperture then you can start to see the tendrils uh, those little you know claw looking things that are actually in the nebula um, I find that an O3 filter maybe an H beta would help bring this detail out but you're going to need some dark skies and pretty decent aperture probably 18 or bigger um, to really get those tendrils I've only seen it in a 28 on my friend's uh, telescope years ago and we were using a UHC and we're able to see it night vision it's a walk in the park um but for visual, it is very challenging. Imaging wise, um, the Crab Nebula, it's small. So you want to make sure that you have the image scale that's going to bring that out. Um, and you want to give it enough time. This is where narrow band filters really start to help because it'll bring out that detail and that structure that you're looking for that kind of all the tendrils in there best come out in hydrogen alpha because they're in that red part of the spectrum. So if you want to get that kind of detail, you're going to need some narrow band assistance um, in your image there. But give it a go. It's a fun one to go after. But just keep in mind that image scale is really going to be your friend on this because it's fairly small um, in the field there. This is shot at a thousand millimeters and cropped. And it's still, while it has good detail, it's still small. So that's something that you're going to be aware of. Another good one that's up right now is the Cone Nebula. This is in Monoceros, about 2,700 light years away. You can actually see this in dark skies with a minimal aperture instrument. Um, I would probably use a UHC filter on this. Um, you could try an Oxygen 3 or an H beta, but UHCs tend to be a fairly broad uh, panel for you to be able to get this. So I would recommend a UHC. Um, imaging. It does really well in one shot color. It also does good in narrow band or um, it does uh, very nicely with um, Hubble palette. 
as well. This is a bicolor image again. I'm not a big fan of Hubble palette just because a lot of targets up there just don't have the signal in the S2 uh, filter. So I find it's just better to hit it with the oxygen three and the H alpha and then blend them together to make a multi-band uh, shot like this. But this is the cone nebula or the Christmas tree cluster. It's got a couple different names there, but that's in Monoceros. It's a very cool target. Uh, lots of structure in there, but it's more doable visually than people think. But having that dark sky to back you up is, is very, very helpful. Um, right next door is actually another one in Monoceros. And if you have a large enough field of view to get both of them together, these actually connect. Um, there's a very long tail that comes off the Rosette Nebula that connects down into the Cone Nebula. It's something that I've tried to do via Mosaic, but it, it requires a very large field of view. Uh, to get those and both of these are fairly large nebulas um, this is a good one in dark skies the trick about the rosette is it's a lot bigger than you probably think so when you end up getting on this target a lot of times you're in the middle of it and it requires you to kind of pan around and check out the detail there um, the rosette has some very nice structure in it um, with the dark nebulas that kind of weave through the core there it's got a nice cluster in there UHC or O3 will help, um, but again, it's a very large target. So if you're visually trying to catch it, a lot of the larger aperture instruments, you end up sitting in the middle of it. So you have to kind of move around to see what detail that you can find in there. Now, uh, imaging wise, this does very well. Um, it's pretty much easy in town. It, does, it reacts very well because it's an emission nebula you can actually get out and uh, image it in town with the narrow band filters. Uh, does good with one shot color as well, but uh, the biggest challenge I would say with the rosette is it's a very large target. So you're gonna need some field of view to catch it. Um, so give it a shot. All right, uh, Abel 12. Um, this is also in the constellation, the Hunter, 6,900 light years away. This one's a lot easier than you might think think but it's definitely off the beaten path that's the reason why it's called the hidden gem nebula um it's right off the bright naked eye star mu orionis um which is like magnitude four um so it is a naked eye star but the little planetary nebula sits obviously behind it i think the star is about 140 light years away or something like that so 6900 light years is the distance of the planetary so it's more of an optical alignment there but if you're not careful in this region it just looks like a reflection and it's a small planetary um now with planetaries you can try to go deep by doing a long exposure but a lot of times you end up blowing the actual nebula out so this one i would probably say you want to do some shorter exposures to actually bring out the detail um in there but it's a fun one to go after because it's one that is overlooked quite a bit um, but I'm a big fan of planetary nebulas, so I'm always uh, looking for little tiny gems to go after. But there it is right there. It looks like a reflection off of Mu Orionis, but um, it's a fun one to go after. It's very easy to find, but if you're not careful, it would look like a reflection. Uh, let's see. I know there's some questions here. Um, so before we jump into target of the month, I want to just address some of the questions here. Let's see. What's the lowest operating temperature of a sky watcher mount i'm looking at negative 32 c tonight and don't plan on going out um i unfortunately live in the united states and we did not go over to celsius um so let me we usually tend to go down to zero degrees and after you go down to zero you're kind of on your own but i've had people do it um the grease that we use on our mounts though could easily go well below um, that. So, uh, oh, negative 26 degrees Fahrenheit. So chilly. Um, it's hard to say if your mount's going to have issues or not. Um, usually, it's not something that really comes up. It's, it shouldn't be a problem, um, but every mount is different, especially if you're one of these people who's messed with the gear mesh. If you have adjusted your gear mesh on your mount, 
I don't know what's going to happen with it because I have a lot of people who do mess with their mounts and they mess with the gear meshing because they want to get rid of the backlash, um, which happens. But if you adjust these too tight, you can cause binding, especially in very cold temperatures. If you've just let it the way the factory has set it, odds are I think you'll be okay. It's not a common occurrence where that's a problem. So I would say you'd probably be fine if you are having issues. I would say it's probably because of the cold. Um, but I think you should be okay. Everything else in there should be fine. Like the board and the motors and all of that. As long as you have good power running to it, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, let's see. I can see the nebulosity around the cone nebula, but have never seen the... Uh, never been able to successfully see the dark cone itself. You need a night vision. Plain as day at that point. Especially if you're using 12 inch and 17 and a half inch telescopes. Um, but the cone is kind of a difficult thing to see. Um, maybe try a different filter. Try an H beta filter. That might actually help because it's a very heavy uh, hydrogen region. So an H beta might be a good one to try if you have that uh james good day kevin what uhc filter do you recommend um you know i had an astronomic one before it got stolen um i really like astronomics uh botters are fine you know even optolongs are fine i find the visual filters aren't really a big deal most of them are pretty good nowadays but botters are nice um astronomic is nice I'd say whatever you can get your hands on is normally pretty good. So I wouldn't put too much effort into it. Most filters right now are over 90% transmission and light transmission. So you should be good no matter who you go with. One I have wanted to try because it's a modification of the UHC is the Teleview Nebustar. Um, it's a little bit tighter um, than a UHC is. And I've have a friend of mine who just got one and he's been kind of impressed with it. Um, so that's a filter I'd like to try is the Teleview Nebustar because um, it's kind of a hybrid UHC. Um, it's got a little different light curve from a UHC that I think helps a little bit more. So, um, but yeah, the Botter one or Astronomic would be my picks probably right now. I just got an Optolong one. I think a two inch one's like under a hundred bucks. So you could always try one of those as well, but um, was very happy with my astronomic ones, but they, they are a little pricey. They're about 200 and something dollars each. So, but yeah, I don't think there's a problem with any of them. All right. That seems to be the questions there. So target of the month. Um, here are the rules of target of the month. Um, if you've never done this before, um, target of the month, it's an imaging thing only because we actually have to know that you did it. Um, unfortunately, there's not a way to, other than the honor system to know that you did things visually, but it's just a fun program that we seem to have a lot of people having a good time with, but we try to pick out a challenging target of the month and have you go after it and see what you can do. And hopefully, uh, you can do it. It pushes the limits. These are not Messier targets usually. Um, we try to make them challenging um, and we're trying to up the ante a little bit more each time. So we're going to try to up the difficulties quite a bit um, on various targets. Um, so we try to go after some exotic stuff that's off the beaten path and hopefully it gives you something fun to do that you've never tried before. Um, so when doing this, you have to email your entry to totem at skywatchusa.com. We need your name, equipment, image specifications, mailing address, so we can send you your fun patch. Um, it's the U.S. and Canada only. I'm sorry. Uh, that's the region. And we do need a FIT file or RAW file um, so we know that you actually did it in the time frame. No old data. Like, you have to shoot it within the month that we do it. Uh, so every year, we have a new totem patch. Uh, it started in 2022. Um, I do understand some of you are still waiting on your 2022 patches. We've shipped every one of them out so far. So hopefully you've gotten yours. If you haven't, they have been shipped. Um, all of you who have participated in the, um, up or whatever, bleh, I'm trying to think what's going on here. Hold on guys. I need to fix something here. All of you that participated in last month's totem. Uh, which is the January um, totem. 
um, all of you actually are have the uh, patches have actually shipped already so you will be getting yours here in the next um, week or so but we shipped pretty much everyone's patches as of yesterday so um, if you are waiting for that that uh, you will be starting to see your patches coming up um, in the next week or so um, so January 2023 um, the challenge target was ARP 273 or the rose um, which was a very nice target to go after um, celestial rose uh, and a lot of you did a very nice job on this it's a very challenging target because it's very small um, and that's kind of the reason for this one it's not that it was difficult or super obscure or needing dark skies it's just tiny and it's off the beaten path um, but we've had some really good submissions um, this month so thank you to everyone who has gone out and actually attempted uh, this one like I said um, if you have sent us your data um, it's already uh, we've already shipped your patches so they are on the way right now um, for anyone who's actually uh, submitted it so we definitely appreciate all of you trying it um, and doing some really nice work with it um, so there's some impressive images that came through um, with some really nice detail um, especially everyone who's given it a go um, for as challenging of a target as it is so we definitely appreciate everyone who's taken part of it all of your patches are actually on the way uh, that brings us to totem uh, for February um, we've actually talked about it already this is our totem target of the month uh, this will be Abel 12 the hidden gem uh, we just talked about this with objects uh, deep sky targets up for the month um, this one is very easy to find but it's a little bit tricky to shoot um, I found this myself uh, the same way actually I think it's more difficult to process um, to get a good shot of it because it looks like a reflection it's very small um, that bright star Mu Orionis is going to give you a lot to play with and contend with um, this is a bicolor image with H alpha and O3 um, I would try to do some shorter exposure so you can bring out the detail it would benefit from some longer focal length and some image scale so I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys can get uh, for this month but the Abel 12 is the target um, that's already up on the website if you want to know more about Abel 12 but I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys get um, so that's pretty much it for the month uh, of what's coming up uh, we definitely appreciate you hanging out with us every Friday morning uh, if you like what you see here please go ahead and subscribe leave a like on the video um, and if you have some ideas for a future what's up webcast email us at info at skywatcherusa.com and title it what's up um, but that pretty much wraps up what we're talking about for February night skies uh, next week we're going to be talking about the solar quest mount um, this is our little it looks a lot like an AZ GTI but it's its own animal um, this is a mount specifically designed for solar observing and tracking the sun it's something that if you're going to the eclipses I would recommend taking a look at so that's what we're gonna go into detail next Friday um, so we'll be happy to have you along the ride with that um, but other than that that pretty much wraps up the month I don't see any more pictures hanging or pictures uh, I don't see any more comments floating around or questions um, so if you have anything else you can always email us at support at skywatchusa.com or um, however you'd like to get a hold of us but thank you very much for hanging out with us on your Friday morning I hope you have some clear skies this weekend um, it's full moon good luck on the comment um, but uh, we definitely appreciate you hanging out with us I'm sorry James it's 548 and it's not easy to catch us I'm sorry that's why they're all recorded if you ever want to go back you can always watch these again but thanks for everybody who's been watching. We certainly appreciate it. Hope you learned something. And it's been nice hanging out with you this morning. Clear skies. And we'll see you guys next uh, Friday. Take care, everyone. See ya. Bye.